Okay, uh, we are here at Expona 2023. Got about 100,000 miles on our speakers, and we're tired, and we have lost our minds. So be prepared for this to be exciting and interesting. I'm Tom Martin. You probably know me because I've made 111 videos in the last year for us. And I'm with Cynthia Blankenship, who's the audio bell and our newest reviewer. And what we're going to do today is pretty straightforward. We're going to talk about the discoveries that we ran across while we were here at Expona. This is not a best of show. You can't go to every room. You can't see everything. It's just not physically possible to do that. Also, some of the stuff you see is not being demoed and you can't declare something you haven't even heard to be amazing. Uh, but there are some things that are interesting that are on static display and yada, 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 yada. So these are things we have discovered and think are interesting and we want to bring them to you. All right, so I'm going to kick this off. Okay. Cynthia, you can say hello to the camera or something. Hello, camera. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get to Cynthia in a second, but I'm going to kick this off with what I felt was my first discovery. And some of this is just stuff I like or think is good for the industry. And that's the case with my first pick, which is a new small version of the Pearl from Cabas. It is in a, it's not really a straight rectangular box, but it's a box shaped speaker. It's very small and uh, it follows in the footsteps in my mind of products like the KEF LSX and the KEF LS50 wireless where it kind of can be your whole audio system. You can, it's got a streamer built into it, you can plug it into an RJ45. I'm sure you can use it with Wi-Fi, but if you have the ability to wire it, my experience is that's just a better way to go. So you can plug it in, you can stream to it, and it's got the power amps, and the uh, control can be on an iPad, uh, that sort of thing. So it's very much like what uh, Kef has done. What I thought was impressive about it was in demo, uh, it is a gutsy, powerful sound that I think would work well for a lot of people who want to have this as a system in their living room. It's super low footprint, so it just doesn't take over the room, but it produces a big expansive sound and yeah, take me from the audiophile community. It, I don't think it's like flat and perfect. It isn't head in a vice kind of imaging. It's just very musically tuned and yet dynamic and uh, engaging in such a way that I could imagine playing it at a party. And I don't know if you've ever walked around, uh, like I've walked around my system and I've got my system set up for my listening chair and you know, I do the audiophile thing and I love it and it's my favorite thing in life. But at a party, you're just walking around and the, the, the sound has to be bigger and sound better and be punchier and more dynamic. And I felt like this was what these kibasses did while not mutilating the music. What I like is you don't have to know how to put an audio system together to use it. And you don't have to consume the space. It's just what you see is what you get. What, well, what you see is what you get and you don't need anything else. Uh, you, you could hook it up to an iPad, but there's a an LCD on the top panel of the right speaker, and you can control it from that one speaker. Okay. Now, you could use an iPad, and I like, you know, audiophile mode. I like sitting in my listening chair and, you know, going through Tidal and Cobuzz and picking out albums and stuff, but yeah. you wouldn't have to have that. I believe they make a separate box as well. It can be a controller you put elsewhere in the room, and that replicates the LCD panel on the top of the speaker. So okay. you could control it from two locations in the room or three locations if you had a, I say iPad, tablet. It really felt like, in, in a, a positive way, a real consumer product. Okay. You know, and again, I, 
I like setting up turntables, but that's not how to invite people into mm -hmm. the sport. So what'd you find? Uh, I found a lot of things, things that I discovered for the first time during this show. The most interesting and probably the weirdest at the same time was the, the diptyque planar magnetic speakers because I'm, as everybody who's seen my channel already knows, I'm kind of a diehard Magnapan kind of girl and that's what I've listened to for a long time. And I heard these and they kind of just blew me out of the water and they were weird looking, but they were modern. They kind of look like room dividers, but not in a uh, non-elegant way. They look super yeah, it's elegant. a it's a it's a the ones they showed were black. It's a black yeah. uh, flat panel with um, square perforations that look like a designer laid them out. Although they're in front of the uh, base drivers, and then I think there's a strip where the ribbon tweeter maybe there's a tweeter mid-range i can't remember yeah i can't remember either but they actually had bass and they were playing some really complex songs there was one that everybody says is super complex i don't remember who it's by uh there's a limit to your love i don't huh? and they were playing that and they were playing some some weird stuff from from different movie soundtracks and some different songs just to kind of give you an idea of what these speakers could do and so i thought that was really cool they were kind of thinking outside of the box not not playing necessarily the same things but kind of giving their speakers a little workout for the audience which was really interesting uh so cynthia stole one of mine the diptyque is also on my list um it sounded quite good uh, the rooms here are on the small side, and so they have some, I mean, every room has bass resonances, but these, a lot of the rooms had a problem with too much bass, and I would say Diptyque actually demoed with too much bass, but after you went to 10 rooms, you realized almost everybody has too much bass. So it, it was very hard to judge bass, and that's true in general, but I thought the Diptyques had a uh, clarity and a smoothness that was quite enjoyable together with the hope that they deliver uh, bass output that's unusual for uh, dipole. As those of you who fell asleep to my various Magnapan videos about how dipoles work, there's just a natural 6 dB per octave roll off when you get to a certain frequency that's where the wavelengths are bigger than the baffle width. These are not super wide. No, I'd, I'd no, go two feet, maybe. They're, they're about as wide as maybe like a 3.7i, I would say. Yeah, so it's 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 not a small speaker. They're tall. Uh, I would say six feet tall, but I didn't measure them. Uh, and I agree with Cynthia. They're quite attractive, and I could imagine, I forgot to ask, but I could imagine that they might make them in white as well as black or some other colors that uh, would, would like lo look really so, nice. Because it was a really pretty design. I thought. Yeah, it's the kind of speaker that it, it it would be super obvious in the room, but people would walk into the room and go, "Oh, what's that?" Right, and, and it the doesn't, interior designer would still. Yeah, the interior it. designer, I think, in some cases, uh, would be okay with it. Now, I will say they're fifty thousand dollars, and at fifty k, they better be good. So we we're just are not in a position to judge whether they really are like a a good value at 50K. I know it sounds weird to say a good value at 50K, but with $750,000 speakers on the market, we can talk about that. But it, I thought that was real promise to the diptyque. That brings me to uh, my second discovery observation after the diptyque, which is here I thought the demo tracks were disappointing and i'm not faulting the vendors the vendors pretty much to a person will say they have learned to play what people want to hear but what that tends to be is very low complexity music cynthia mentioned the complexity of what the diptyque people played and that was really uh, pleasure because you could actually start to hear whether the product, whether it was a amplifier or cables or whatever it was, speakers in the case of the diptyques, uh, you could hear 
what it was capable of doing. And I sometimes felt like, and I don't think this is the case, but I sometimes felt like people were hiding the limited upper mid-range and high frequency capability of the speaker by staying away from complex stuff. But I think it's really that the move is to less and less complex music and more and more stuff that's got a heavy bass line and a singer. And that's fine and that's interesting, but I was a little bit disappointed by that. And uh, I hope, well, the, the discovery was that at shows, uh, streaming has transformed the experience you can have because you can just go in and ask for something else to be played and anybody can really play anything because they've got Tidal and Cobuzz on an iPad and you know I asked for Mahler's first and bam you get Mahler's first. Yeah I heard somebody ask for a really random test recording that he only had on a CD but the particular showroom only had streaming and he was able to just pull it up. Yeah yeah so streaming is for shows is, is, is a wonderful thing. Okay, what have you got next? So, at home I have a Sioux Research subwoofer that's actually my husband's, and I've heard Sioux Research, I've heard SVS subwoofers, but there was one particular subwoofer company I hadn't heard yet that somebody recommended I go up and listen to, and that was the Per Listen Room. I hadn't heard their subwoofers before, and I heard their entry-level line just yesterday. And I had no idea that they... And when you say entry level, what kind of price point are we talking about, or points? They were around $3,000. Okay. So entry level for them was around $3,000. But they were THX certified, which I didn't realize that subwoofers could be TH THX certified before. And I had never heard a subwoofer that, that was, I guess. So that was my first time hearing... And did you feel like it was. sounded different? Oh, yeah. Okay. There was a big difference. So it still had the slam effect that I like out of a subwoofer. I, mean, I like a lot more modern music and whatnot. But at the same time, it was really balanced. And they had the ability to just kind of balance it. I think they had one of those LCD things on the top of it so they could easily kind of dial it down or dial it up as they needed to. And so for me, I was like, well, play the bassiest thing you've got. I want to hear how muddy this thing gets or whether it stays completely balanced and, and doesn't. And it stayed balanced, it had a lot of clarity, nice, tight, crisp bass, and it just, I didn't have any issues with it. So, yeah, which is rare for a subwoofer. Right, it's, it's rare Of course, for they had the chance to dial it in, but. But from what I learned about the THX certified subwoofers is they have to be, I think it's below a 0.5% distortion rate to get that certification. And so to me, that was really cool. Yeah. So I, I had gone and listened to that room and also the per listen bookshelf speakers were quite good. When I first came into the room, there was, there was a ton of people in there and I didn't really get a, an opportunity to get to sit down and focus. And I ended up going back and giving it another chance when I heard about the subwoofers. And that's when I told him, play something super bassy. And then he played this track that just it was full body. It extended to show off both the bookshelf speakers and the subwoofers, and I really liked both of those. So. Cool. Yeah, I think um, I would observe that we're getting to a point in the industry where there is a greater and greater acceptance of subwoofers, and as an advocate of subwoofers, because of how the freedom it gives you in setting up the main speakers. Uh, my next discovery was the new YG Acoustics Peaks series. Uh, they demonstrated a main speaker called the Talus, which is an interesting, the driver complement is two-way with a roughly six inch woofer and a one inch soft dome type tweeter, but in a cabinet, about this tall, so I think it's designed to extend the base a little bit more than you might have in a typical mini monitor kind of cabinet. That's part A, but then they showed it and demoed it with a matching subwoofer. And what I liked about that was, A, you could have it the same driver complement in a mini monitor stand mount kind of configuration. They claim the voicing is slightly different, which it's, it's bound to be, but if that's the way you needed to go, you could have that. That was 
kind of nice, but the real thing was the sub integration was great. And they are very clear that phasing on subwoofer setup is important. I'll be doing a subwoofer setup uh, piece in a couple of weeks and show you how to adjust phase or one way to do it. But what I, what I loved about this Peaks idea was they've tried to cater to a market that doesn't want to have to learn somewhat complicated math. My setup approach involves measurement and they're just, I think a lot of us who just aren't going to go there. They're not, they're not going to do that. So they tell you how to set up the sub with the mains in a very specific alignment that just works. And so what they said was, I was like, well, okay, so, but you cheated, right, on doing the setup? And they're like, no, we followed the instructions. So what you heard demoed was us following the instructions <laughs> in a difficult room. Mm -hmm. uh, and the results were quite, quite good. Um, so I like the fact that it's aimed at uh, how do I put this in a room and do it in a way where I get good results because it's really easy to make a mess out of a sub. And then I really like the fact that the, the sub satellite integration was very, very nice. So I think YG is onto something there and they're trying to go down a path, which I thought was admirable, where they've got a line, that's the Peaks series, that is aimed at the consumer who doesn't want to go deep into hobbyist level integration and then have the reference series for the people like me who like, you know, taking out uh, tape measures and adjusting the angle of the speaker relative to the listener and measuring the sidewall differences and getting absolute symmetry. Getting nerdy with it. And getting really nerdy with it. I, I love that. I like doing it. So I'm a reference series kind of person, but I, th I could really imagine a lot of people getting great value out of the peaks kind of approach. And they're also bringing their stuff down to a lower price point. That's not okay. low, that's lower price point. And uh, anyway, the Peaks Talus with, uh, I think it's called the Descent Subwoofer, had a very, very enjoyable sound. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of the Absolute Sound. We have a new product. It's on the Substack platform. And we're going to do some interesting things with Substack. First of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks, and now back to the show. What have you got next? So I heard these other bookshelf speakers called the well, the company was called Atome. I don't remember the model, but they were these bookshelf speakers. They're really pretty, pearly white color, and you could hear the sound from outside of the room. So, of course, I had to stop in my tracks and just kind of walk in. I was in the middle of going somewhere else, but I ended up going in there and listening for probably, I want to say, half an hour, and then they ended up taking me up to their mid-tier speaker, which was more of a tower speaker that sounded like the bookshelves but had a little bit more oomph to the mids I would say and I just they let me go to town and play any anything I pretty much wanted to hear and I got to totally listen to those and the people were super nice the speakers had a really good sound on the top end especially with vocalists the clarity of the vocalists was it was really great and I could hear some things in people's voices that I hadn't heard before in those particular singers voices so listening to those were really nice did you get to listen to the no I times? didn't but that's that's one of the great things about a show where you've got multiple reviewers people discover stuff all over the place and you're like I didn't even go to that room I didn't even know where it was you know so anyway and 
you guys don't need to know about all the nerdy show dynamics, but there are like people in rooms and you can't find them. Because it's a hotel and a conference center and they're all spread out and anyway. And there's 16 floors of rooms and they're all over the place. Yeah, so, so. anyway, it's easy to miss stuff. Um, all right, my uh, next one is the Aratai stand mount. You know, expectations matter in all things and they certainly matter in audio. I have to admit, I went into this one thinking, this just, this isn't gonna work. Uh, I think the design is really nice. Maybe it's just me, but it's a standard bookshelf, except it's got, uh, it's not a horn, but it's got some kind of a waveguide on the top that is made out of a beautiful white, I would say ceramic, but it, I don't actually know what the material is. It's a, it's a simple but eye-catching design. If you're a fan of Scandinavian design, it's got a little bit of that vibe. For a stand mount, what is interesting is that the woofer is on the back. That gives you the ability to use proximity to the rear wall in a different way. It keeps the front panel relatively small, but the mind blower was the bass was really good. So somebody at Aratai is paying attention to bass because I thought the uh, bass was balanced, tuneful, uh, but had enough power that you're like, is that really, you know, it's sort of a where's the subwoofer yeah. kind of kind of thing, uh, but there was no subwoofer. Anyway, I thought the Aratai sounded quite nice. I have some questions about the um, upper mid-range performance, but some of that from past experience can just be like, did somebody bump the speaker before I listened to it and the toe-in was wrong? You know, did go, something happen to it on the way here? Yeah, I mean, or the hotel I, I don't think it was damaged, but and the hotel rooms present a lot of limitations. So, you know, the rule is when you hear something that's good, it's probably because the product is right. When you hear something that's not right, it might just be something completely separate. But I have, I have a question mark about the the upper mids, but other than that, uh, really, I thought interesting speaker and a speaker that I could totally imagine having in your living room, not just in your listening room. You've got something else? I'm, I'm not trying to wear you thin. No, you're good. I'm just, you're, you're a lot more technical than I am, so. Oh no, people want to stab me to death. Don't <laughs> stab me. If you see me, don't stab me, please. So, this was my first show here in Golden Years. And I really liked the, I don't know the exact model, they were the Tridents, mm -hmm. and they were this- Is this the new gorgeous. one they introduced? Because they introduced a new speaker. I believe so. They, yeah. had, they had it in the room over behind, it was like in the Saturday audio exchange yeah. area. Yep. yep. So they were these gorgeous, red, cherry red um, cabinets. And they were- and This is a tower speaker, right? Yes. A short yes. tower, but tower short speaker. Tower. It was about yay high, about as high as the, the camera lens here. Right. They were a gorgeous cherry red color, and they were paired with these Macintosh components, which I think brought out some, some really good uh, deliciousness to them. Say deliciousness is probably the best word for it. But what was really cool was they were actually extending the opportunity to listen to stuff that really brought out the bass tones of male vocals. Some, some and you're not saying overemphasized, it just was rich or, well, or was it too much? I think that they were overemphasizing it in the way of they were at least trying to make the point that yeah, these speakers can bring out these bass tones. Now whether or not the recordings they were playing were accurate to the person or not, they were at least trying to show that these speakers can do that and I think they did a really good job of doing so. So I didn't really get a chance to listen to as much of the highs or the mids, but more so maybe the mid to low region of what these speakers could do and they allowed us to listen to some movie trailers, which were really cool. Uh, these speakers did have a certain slam effect to them, which was really interesting. They didn't have any separate subwoofers to them. These speakers were able to do this. I, I will say from past experience, that is a golden ear thing. That's a golden ear Golden thing. ear for, and I think 
prior incarnations of those speakers start to show you a theme that the designers like and they have I think a skill at doing a powerful detailed base it's a hard combination to pull off you can pull off power but get muddy and you right. can pull off detail but actually roll it off and uh, I think golden ears sometimes I haven't heard these I, I want to go by and listen to them. The, the room was just packed when I went there. Um, they could be accused of sometimes overcooking it, mm -hmm. but uh, I think there are a number of listeners who find that sound really engaging. And it's a little bit like what I said with the kibasas. It's like, I don't think they were right, but they were only a little bit wrong in a very enjoyable, engaging direction. Right. And, and I think that's what a lot of people would really enjoy. So I'm glad they sounded good. We'll have to go back and hear more on the mids and highs, and maybe we can uh, get a set for a review. Okay. I think there's there's real promise there. I think so. They were they were playing these tracks from this this guy who sounded just like Johnny Cash. It was I think his band is called The Ghost of Johnny Cash. Uh -huh. And his voice sounds like an exact replica of Johnny Cash except in Johnny Cash's recordings as they're older, uh, his his deeper tones weren't as amplified as this guy. So obviously it's not realistic so to speak, but it was really cool to actually hear that brought out of the male voice, I thought. Okay. It's interesting. All right, the next one I want to mention is Luxman. Luxman showed a new turntable, played through their big monoblock amps and their big preamp into Magico speakers, and it sounded wonderful. Luxman tends to have a sound that is not easy to demo at a show because the background noise is they're just people in the halls talking and so it's it's tricky because the Luxman sound is I would say built on a platform of delicacy and nuance and you could hear that they were doing that they were also presenting some new vinyl that had just been finished wow. and uh, some of the recordings that they chose were just yeah, really good. Uh, there, there, there just have to be some music lovers at Luxman who are like insanely dedicated to the craft. I want to say one other thing about the Luxman turntable. Uh, we have a video on it, so you can see what we can capture on video. But the thing is just beautifully made. I mean, that's true of a lot of Luxman stuff. But it's one of those you almost have to see it in person to understand how just beautifully machined the parts are. The wood, is, it looks like it's got 70 layers of lacquer on it. I mean, it's Japanese, so it might have 70 layers of lacquer on it, I don't know. But it's just, it's like, I wanted to have one in my living room because it was just so well built. And then you go to pick it up. I had Charles, our video guy, I said, Charles, come over and try to pick this up. And Charles works out. Charles is a strong guy. He puts his hand on it, tries to one-handed, and expects to just lift it up. And he, one-handed, he couldn't lift it without, like, going, oh, wait, let me start again. And, like, I'm doing deadlifts kind of thing. How much did it weigh? Well, I think it weighs 60 pounds. 60 pounds? Which, you know, there are plenty of 60-pound turntables, but this just looks like a regular, you know, square. But there... I don't know what's in there. I think the platter weighs 22 pounds, though. Wow. Something like maybe 17. But it's this is a heavyweight piece of equipment. I haven't seen it yet, but it sounds like a work of art. I really, really liked it. It's very conservatively styled. This is not, you know, Darth Vader got together with Luke Skywalker and did a turntable. This is a turntable from 1970 <laughs> done with, like, precision machining. But I really liked it. So, you got something else? So there was one room that I thought was unique, to say the least. I had a viewer that wanted me to go check out the Odyssey room because he was really into Odyssey amplifiers. So I hadn't heard anything Odyssey before and really? I went and checked out their room. And as soon as I walked in the room, it was pitch dark. 
except for some candle lights and there was incense burning you could smell it <laughs> and I walk in there and I don't know whether to think that I just walked into the 60s into a hippies room or whether this was some sort of a cult <laughs> because it could have gone either way it was really strange but really cool and it made you feel at home that you were at home listening and there wasn't a whole bunch of people surrounding you even though there were a lot of people in the room listening but the fact that they had the lights dimmed and they just had this slow lighting made you feel comfortable to sit down and listen and everybody was listening to a Pink Floyd record and I just thought that <laughs> to, to, to fit with the <laughs> fit, maybe these are hippies the yeah right. I hope there wasn't a bong in the corner <laughs> I don't know. They had a dark, yeah. so I couldn't yeah, tell. Yeah, you couldn't what see. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the speakers and the amplifiers, I I really enjoyed those. The, you could tell there was a lot of power going into the speakers, so I knew that there was something to those amplifiers that was magical. I don't know what it was, and I wish I could have got some better pictures. We could, but it was so dark in there that you couldn't see anything. However, just the whole ambience and everything, I thought they did it right because I'm stepping into a room where I actually feel like I'm sitting at home and, and listening. And I think that more so versus the product, but the, the actual room was what got me on that one. Okay. And that was a discovery in a way for me. Well, yeah, environment matters. Uh, it, 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 it is a challenge for some of us to listen with 20 people standing in the room and people walking around and and all of that kind of thing. There is something about it though that, I mean, there are some rooms where people are just kind of, it, it's an audio show, there's so many people here. And so you're trying to squeeze past other people to hear something in one room, whereas this one, because it was so quiet and it was dimly lit, there seemed to be this completely different vibe of people uh, being really careful not to run into other people going in there and just being super respectful of um, taking turns and sitting down and different things. So it was, it was different. Yep. Well, picking up on that theme, uh, my next one, uh, uh, and I'm going to finish with this because I'm, I'm deeply disturbed by what we heard. We went for an after hours demo of the Linkwitz reference speaker. You almost never go to an audio demo and hear something completely unlike what you've heard before. The Linkwitz speakers create a sound stage that is three times deeper, four times deeper than anything I've ever heard before. You have the speakers, it was a pretty small setup, so I would say the speakers were maybe seven or eight feet from us. Okay. And the, the front of the soundstage sounded like it was three feet behind the speakers and extended to about 12 feet behind the speakers. I mean, it was like, it was like outside the room. How did they manage to pull that off? Kind of stuff. And That's then crazy. they played some stuff, special recording technology, where the speaker could precisely image in front of the plane of the speakers on the left or in the corner behind the speakers. This sounds like a gimmick. Let me just like, like stop myself there. I'm trying to indicate how impressively different it was. And yet, when you listen to music you knew, and most music didn't throw an image in front of the plane of the speakers, that was some stuff done by Roger Waters or somebody using a technique that was developed in the 80s, so it's 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 an it, it is an effect, but that's what the artist wanted. The artist wanted stuff happening over here, but on real music, they played a lot of jazz trio quartet kind of stuff, and it sounded like the speakers were in the tables in front of you, and then there really was the band on a stage out there, <laughs> and Charles, who's not really an audio guy. I kept turning around and going, do you hear that? And he would go, yeah, I mean, he was 10 times more engaged by the Linkwitz demo than any other demo we went to. Uh, They're shipping the speakers from the show to me, so I will be doing a review of them because I want to 
put them in a known environment with known recordings and see if I can do what they did or, you know, did they slip something into my drink. Is it and too good to be true? You just want to yeah, make sure it's, that it's, it's this not. seriously could be too, too good to be true. But uh, this was truly exceptional and musical. I want to find the downside. Not, not, not like that's a mission, but I want to make but you sure. you got to find the cracks. I, I, I want so to look, speak. look at least. But there's something exceptional going on there. If you get to hear a Linkwitz demo, please do so. But I'll be doing a review in a month or so. Anyway, do you have anything else? I don't think so. Okay. I will finish with one thought. Uh, I really felt like the industry was making a bit of a turn on the ergonomics front. Um, lots of stuff, of course, controlled by apps. I think that's good. Streaming uh, has some wonderful qualities. I like the sensitivity to the return of vinyl, which has been happening for more than a decade, but it's, it's uh, clearly a big thing. User interface is becoming a bigger deal. And I want to finish that thought with one final thing, which is I saw several cable manufacturers doing small cables. I don't know about you, and of course I have to do wiring like every week, so it's a bigger pain if you're a reviewer than it is if you're a normal audiophile. But the snake pit behind my uh, equipment rack is frightening. It's seriously, I don't know, there are pythons and rattlesnakes and other bad things down there, and I just don't like it. And the ability to have a smaller cable that's easier to dress, doesn't take over the world, you don't have to fight it. I have speaker cables right now that I can't bend. Really? Yeah, they're in, a, they're in an arc and you just have to, you kind of have to, you know, you're, you're moving a hula hoop into position, anyway enough of Tom's concerns, but even the cable manufacturers are paying attention to ergonomics. I feel like the, the thread moving in the direction of consumer-friendly UI was, I, I, I feel it a little bit. The hair shirt mentality of if it's hard to use, then it must be good, seems to be uh, diminished. So I thought that was Great. One final thing I will say, I probably said the last thing was the final thing, but one final thing I will say is uh, I thought the show was quite busy and the vibe was really good. There are a lot of people who are really enjoying what audio does for their lives and uh, you could just feel it in the, in the halls. So thanks for joining us. I know this was super extended dance mix, but uh, that's what Tom does. It's super extended dance mix. Uh, Cynthia, thank you. Uh, You're welcome, Tom. And uh, I didn't make you dance, so you should thank me. I can't dance, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> okay. Cynthia plus me equals zero on dancing. Anyway, thanks for joining us. Thank you.